Hey everyone, welcome to my first video of 2021. I'm very grateful to be talking to you guys about a wildcard playoff game this weekend. My first one of these videos came in 2009, and I didn't get to talk about a playoff game for about eight years. So this is now the third one in the last four years, so I'm happy to have seen the Bills progress to a playoff caliber team. Hopefully they are now a playoff win caliber team, and I think you have every right to believe that they are. The Bills finished the season at 13-3 and against Miami, a team that was essentially playing for their playoff lives. They're in a win-and-in situation, and they come to Buffalo knowing that they're probably not going to see the starters the entire time, and what do they do? They just dig themselves a 28-6 to hole right in the first half. And if you've followed me throughout the years, you know that I hate certain terminology amongst sports commentators and the way the game is talked about, such as momentum, obviously. And this week, I just want to say that the Bills completely quelled the idea of starting fast. If you listen to broadcasts or hear coaches speak, they'll always emphasize how important it is to start fast. Of course, it's nice to start fast. The other team could put you in a hole pretty quickly if you don't. But it is certainly not necessary. The Bills are the living, breathing example of that on Sunday against Miami because they start the drive with an interception that leads to three Miami points, then a punt, then a punt, and I think most fans at that point were just like, forget it. Let's get the starters out of there. Josh Allen, I'm sure, was clamoring to Coach McDermott about wanting to go back out there and putting together a scoring drive. So what does he do? He puts together three. They get a punt return from Isaiah McKenzie, uh, you know, in the middle of their three scoring drives. They make it 28-6, to like I said, at halftime. And Miami is pretty much just dead at that point. They are looking ahead to 4 o'clock, knowing that they are going to need somebody to lose. Uh, most likely Indianapolis, I guess. You know, Cleveland could have come into play here, or Baltimore, but they both won their games at 1 o'clock. So Miami is now needing help. And if I'm Miami, I think this completely destroyed the idea of Brian Flores winning the Coach of the Year honors, which I think that he was definitely in a running for, and maybe shifted that nod to Sean McDermott a little bit. I'm not really going to speculate on that either way. But if you're Miami, okay, if you're watching that game, Please build around Tua. Build around Tua. I like. How could you have watched that game and thought that Tua was the answer? You now have the third overall pick by virtue of your trading Laramie Tunsil to Houston. How could you not consider a quarterback at third overall after watching what Tua did? And you know what? Somebody will point to how many yards did he end up with. He ended up with a lot. Tua finished with 361 and a touchdown and three picks. But like... Did you watch the game? It was, like, if I, I didn't have a spray chart in front of me, but, like, it was all five-yard throws here, there, quick slants and stuff. He finally started taking some chances to Devontae Parker, who put together a nice game for him, seven for 116, but on 14 targets. You know, the Dolphins didn't have their closer, Ryan Fitzpatrick, to come in and bail them out because he had tested positive for COVID, so now you're getting a taste of what life is like with Tua and you're clearly just not on the same level as the Bills. You think you have all these all-pro corners, Byron Jones, Xavier Howard. Xavier Howard had a really nice interception. Uh, I think Jones did as well. Didn't matter. None of it mattered. They allowed 56 points. Seven touchdowns on defense. Fine, go ahead. Build around two, just like the Bills built around E.J. Manuel and gave him Sammy Watkins and whatever. Like, no, you're just, you're just delaying the inevitable you will soon realize that you have a quarterback problem. And I know it's probably too early to reach. You'll say Some of you will think it's too early to reach on that. It's not. It's absolutely not too early to reach on that. You need to know the answer. And I think you got your answer. You know, the GM, Chris Greer, is already talking about how he's going to be the starter perfect. I can't wait for next year. I think we're going to beat Miami twice again next year. But let's slow down. Let's get to the playoffs first. Let's do this. Let's have some more fun this year. It's a little bit... Scary, in a way, isn't it? As fun as this year has been, and it's been fun. Like, even the game that they lost to, like, Arizona, that was a fun game. It just hurt at the end. But, like, it's fun. 
Like, we are that Hail Mary away from talking about, like, a 10-game win streak here, right? Something like that. Not 10-game win streak, but a 9-game win streak. Yeah, no, check that. 10. Because it was 4-2. and two. Yeah, sorry, I'm just doing the math wrong. We are that Hail Mary away from talking about a 10-game win streak for the Bills. Our Buffalo Bills have won 9 out of their last 10 games heading into the playoffs. And like I said, as fun as it has been, it could be over. In a flash on Saturday. The Indianapolis Colts are coming to town. You know, there was a some... Well, when the 4 o'clock game started, I think mostly everyone thought Indianapolis was going to beat... Uh, was going to beat Jacksonville. You know, it got a little bit close there. There was still a scenario for the Bills to play Miami if um, Indy had lost and Tennessee had won. And there was the scenario for Tennessee if Tennessee had lost and Indy had won and whatnot, but it ends up being Indianapolis, you know, Tennessee wins on a deep pass to A.J. Brown and a doink field goal in, and that that's really all that kept Tennessee from coming to Buffalo, and honestly, if I'm talking about matchups, I don't really want Tennessee as much as I would want, uh, you know, Indy, and I don't say that because Tennessee whooped the Bills earlier this year, I say that because Ryan Tannehill, I think, is super valuable to the Titans. Obviously, Derrick Henry is as well. Rushes for over 2,000 yards. I'm not going to take anything away from him. A.J. Brown is a fantastic player. One of my favorite players in the league. But I don't love Tannehill's mobility inside the pocket. I would much rather, as an opposing fan, I don't love his mobility. I mean, I would much rather see Phillip Rivers, who is just going to stand there like a statue, will maybe move around three steps to his left or his right, but you know where he's going to be, and you know where you can send guys. Now, he's a pretty good quarterback in his own right. He's been in the league for a long time, obviously. Um, and he threw for 4,000 yards this year, 4,100 yards, completed 68% of his passes, 24 touchdowns, 11 picks. But there's still this weird thing with the Colts where they use Jacoby Brissett in certain situations because Phillip Rivers is maybe the worst quarterback in NFL history when it comes to like quarterback sneaks, him and Roethlisberger. Maybe just old guys, like Rodgers I don't think does it either. Like The old guys are just like, I'm not getting in the pile like that. Brady would be the exception to the rule, who is got to be about 99.9% on his conversion rate on quarterback sneaks. The guy is insane at it, but whatever. We If we play Tom Brady this year... That would be good news because it means we're in the Super Bowl. What, like how, what is the word, liberating would that be if the Bills beat Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl? Again, Greg, getting ahead of yourself, one week at a time, the Colts. I, I don't necessarily think the Colts are better off with Phillip Rivers than Jacoby Brissett, to be totally frank with you. I think that Brissett could give them maybe just as much. I don't maybe maybe wouldn't throw for as many yards, or but he would be... A little bit more agile inside the pocket, you know, his escapability. They use him to that effect even now. Um, what did he do? He had a couple, um, I mean, he only has 19 rushing yards on the season, I guess. But he does have three touchdowns for them. And he's only thrown, attempted eight passes. I mean, does it really matter? I mean, the Bills will probably see him on a couple of snaps, I would assume, on Sunday. Or Saturday, sorry, Saturday afternoon. By the way, don't be mad about the schedule, about not being, like, the 8 o'clock game or anything. Who cares? Who cares when they're playing? Just be excited that they're playing and they are a 13-3 and team. That part is a little frustrating. They're finally the two-seed, obviously, and now the two-seed doesn't get a bye, so they do have to play. But this is, a, this is a Super Bowl, at least appearance, caliber team. And thus, I think, a Super Bowl caliber team. Like, I am almost graduating to the point where I expect them to be in Kansas City in a couple of weeks for the AFC Championship Greg, you're getting ahead of yourself again. Let's talk about the Colts. All right, I talked about how I think Jacoby Brissett, Phillip Rivers, I don't really, I don't know why they felt necessary to sign Phillip Rivers, but they did win 11 games, and they are playoff bound. Um, I think that, I think that they pretty much are going to ride and die on Jonathan Taylor, as much as Phillip Rivers has been, um, you know, pretty efficient for them at quarterback they don't really have a receiver that is outstanding like in the manner that Stephon Diggs has been for the Bills. They have T.Y. Hilton, um, but he, you know, 56 catches for 762 yards. That's in 15 games. He played all but one game this year, 56 for 762, and he's their leading receiver. 
Zach Pascal, 44 for 629. Like these are 20, you know, whatever year, pick a year. Buffalo Bills receiver numbers. Like, oh, we have nice players. This will work. You know, the, the Colts, again, the Colts won 11 games, so I'm not, I'm not just here to drag them. But I'm just, I'm showing you that they are not really a super big threat through the air as much as they seem to be because Rivers threw for 4,000 yards. They dispersed that. You know, I think Naheem Hines led them in receptions. He did with 63. He's a threat. But their biggest threat is Jonathan Taylor. That's what they want to do. They would rather run the ball against you all day with Jonathan Taylor and go home. You know, he ran for 1,100 yards, um, and that kind of came out of nowhere with him. Where's his, I have his blitz up, because he really only had like, like 600 or so yards in the first 12 weeks, and he has 560 in the last four, not to mention seven touchdowns. Obviously, he exploded last week against Jacksonville. Here's my one concern with that. If you want to run the ball, like the Bills, I, I talked about this as a, as a Bills strategy earlier in the year. The Bills wanted to employ the strategy, most notably against Kansas City. They did it against New England the first time as well, where they wanted to run the ball, control clock or something, keep the other offense off the field. But the fact of the matter is the other offense is still super effective when they're on the field. Not so much in the Patriots case, but definitely in the Chiefs case. They limited Tyreek Hill in that game, and hopefully the Colts don't figure out a way to limit Stephon Diggs, or, you know, and he, who's not practicing in the middle of the week, but I think it's just a precautionary thing. He has an oblique injury, you know, and why would you have him in practice doing this and turning and everything? Let it heal. I think that's where that's going. Cole Beasley looks like almost, you know, no shot at playing, so you might, not might, I think you're definitely going to see Kenny Stills in his first game as a Bill, as he was signed to the practice squad early this week. I think he's going to be active, and I think he's going to play. I think, it, you know, John Brown is back. That was nice to see. He scored a long touchdown from Josh uh, uh, against Miami. So you're looking at, at, obviously, Brown, Diggs, and then Stills maybe playing the slot, and obviously Gabe Davis is going to be mixed in as well. I don't think that takes away necessarily from their offense. I, I know that Beasley is a reliable target, a chain mover. He goes to the sticks, turns around, finds the hole, catches the ball first down. They're going to need something. They're going to need that. But they didn't have him on Sunday, and he scored 56 points. So if the Colts want to come into Buffalo and run, 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 like everyone's just like, here's another thing people talk about, like the way broadcasters talk about it. Keep Josh Allen on the sidelines. Okay, but like when he's on the field, they score a lot of points. It will require the offense to be effective on their drives. And the Colts pulls a bit of a threat on defense for that. They have some great signings this past offseason. Uh, DeForest Buckner, well, they traded for. They have Justin Houston. They lead the team in sacks. Um, they are pretty good. They signed Xavier Rhodes, who was terrible with Minnesota last year, but for some reason has kind of found a little bit of a resurgence this, you know, this year with, um, with Indy. They're still young at the cornerback position. Kenny Moores, he's been there a couple of years. Kari Willis, and who's the other safety there? I just had his name, too. Uh, Julian Blackman. A couple nice young players in the secondary. Darius Leonard, obviously a stud at middle linebacker. They, don't, they usually use him most of the time. They'll have other linebackers come in as well and play a little bit. I believe uh, Anthony Walker is one of them. But they usually only play about two-thirds of the snaps. Leonard's out there almost all the time. They like to be fast on defense. They like to add extra corners in there. Rocky Seen and um, TJ Carey's a veteran that they have who's played for them. You know, they want to be faster, and they're going to need to be faster against the Bills because the Bills love to spread it out and throw the ball all over the yard. All in all, I think the Bills are just a better team. I think that they can contain the pass rush. They've played T.J. Watt. They've played Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald took over in the second half of the game. The Bills still won. You know, uh, and, you know, whatever, how it played out. I don't care. I, I expect the Bills to win. You should expect the Bills to win this playoff game. Of course, they're 13-3. and three. They're seven-point favorites. This, this is here for them. It is time. Time to put the big boy pants on and graduate to, like, a playoff contender. The time is now. All right? Guys, hit me up on Twitter. My Twitter handle and YouTube username are the same. Let's talk Bills football. Going to finish it off with a prediction. Bills over Colts, 31-23.
Bill scored 500 points this year. 500 points! Holy moly, I can't believe I ever got to mention that. 501 points. The Bills. Holy smokes. They punted the second fewest times of all time. They tied the Ravens for the second fewest punts in a 16-game season. They're the only team that I see ever to have 20 or more first downs in all 16 games. Our Buffalo Bills trust the offense. Don't think about who they're playing. They don't care who they're playing. They're going to be who they are, I hope. I hope they learn their lesson with just trying to run the football stuff and establishing the run and using the run to set up the play action and set up the pass. No, what sets up the pass? Having Josh Allen, having Stephon Diggs, having John Brown. They won't have Cole Beasley, but being good through the air. That's why they're good. That sets up the pass. That sets up the offense. That sets up the points. Guys, I will talk to you next week for a divisional round playoff game. Enjoy your weekend. As always, above all else, go Bills.